is Forbidden Speech, The Raw Truth, with your host, Christina Rivera. In this savvy broadcasting series, we delve into hot topics affecting us all. With cancel culture and big tech censoring any opposing ideas and thoughts outside of mainstream ideology, it has become more important than ever that we tell the raw truth about everything from U.S. world politics, COVID, Christianity, and everything in between. We invite all points of view to come and share their perspective honestly and respectfully. Hi, Ken W. Good. Welcome to Forbidden Speech, The Raw Truth. We're so grateful to have you here this wonderful Sunday afternoon. Thank you for joining me. We're going to talk about the disastrous effects of bail reform, or as I like to call it, bad bail reform policy across the United States, really affecting a lot of the cities, including Houston, Texas, that I live pretty close by. Uh, You are operating as a bail attorney. Um, And so you're going to share, we're going to go deep. Uh, One thing we're going to talk about is a recent case that hit New York. Uh, There was a guy with, I think, 45, 42 um, arrests, violent arrests in some cases, who actually attacked a woman on the New York City uh, train system and smeared poop all over her and uh, got let loose. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The terrible, terrible time for victims in in the criminal justice system, especially in our urban areas. Because Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the the problem that started all this is how do we process large numbers of people through the jail quickly and efficiently? Mm -hmm. And here we are four, five, six years later, we still don't have a response or an answer to that question Mm -hmm. because everything that's been tried in our urban areas have been disasters. Yeah. Now, now, why why do they think it's a good idea, especially for a violent criminal to be let loose? I, I, if I were a cop in, say, New York, Chicago, or even Houston, if I just kept arresting, getting collars, and then they just get thrown back in the street, I mean, why am I even trying here? Well, you know, I think that I, I think there was a, a several groups joined into a coalition about five years ago, both Mm -hmm. the left and the right saying, oh, we can reform criminal justice reform. And from the right's perspective, we can save money doing it. And Mm -hmm. so for a couple of years, the left and the right were proposing changes that uh, met all those goals. More Mm -hmm. people were being released. And then we also were saving money. The problem is, you know, as you release more criminals, you're going Mm -hmm. to have more crime. And so it got to the tipping point. And the problem is, these this coalition of groups are splintering, but they're only splintering from the far left. We still have right on mm-hmm. crime still proposing these same things that they were pro- proposing three or four years ago, and and they were not really uh, conservative solutions. They were really mm-hmm. first proposed by the left. It's just the now the left no longer supports them, and so now we have them trying to repackage them as conservative solutions, and mm-hmm. we really don't have anybody proposing truly conservative solutions for uh, to address the rising crime or how mm-hmm. to to reform the criminal justice system. Well, see, it would make sense to me if they did um, felonies or, or crimes that weren't violent, like say you got caught first time around, you have some pot on you. Okay, maybe we let you loose for that. But if you've, you know, attacked someone on the New York City train system or smeared poop on them, I, I would say you should get a little bit of time for that. Well, but you know, we've always had a criminal justice system based upon your criminal history or your mm-hmm. past past record. If you've never been in trouble for you get less penalty. But but if you've been arrested for selling marijuana five times, then mm-hmm. you're not going to respond. And even you know low level offenses. You know the uh, this Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Nathan Heck kept using the story about Grandma was in jail for theft and she couldn't afford a bond. What mm-hmm. he kept telling from the story is she wouldn't stop doing petty theft and she had an extensive criminal history so much so that it kept getting stacked so it was a felony when she got arrested so the example he uses it was a felony and so he's kind of not uh he's not a conservative on the issue of criminal justice reform he's yeah. pushing the left uh, uh talking points that have been co-opted by the right and so he's and he's still doing it he's still pushing for a risk assessment which used to be the panacea now only one group supports it and he's their mouth now, tell me, why do you think, say, you know, conservative, non-conservative, what seems to be conservative people in office kind of going for these policies that aren't helpful and, and seemingly more lefty policies? Why, why is that happening to you from your perspective? Well, I think it started out from a saving money. I mean, we were closing jails at one point and saving money. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so I think, uh, you know, as we slowly uh, release more and more cr- criminals, 
then it started becoming a problem. And now we're at a tipping point uh, and we have all these other reforms. And I think, you know, um, I think that they think they know better. And so we have to take discretion away from the trial court. And now we've crossed the line and you see it in New York, you see it in California, you see it in Houston and really bad in Houston. And it starts with not, you know, they say, oh, we've got a we've got a bad problem with serious crime. That problem goes all the way down to even uh, uh, misdemeanors where mm -hmm. in the misdemeanor system, I promise you right now you get arrested for a crime. You'll never see a judge. You'll get released on a hundred dollar PR bond. You will never go to court. And then probably in a year, you'll just get noticed that your case was dismissed. And then the cycle starts all over again. It's, it's, it, it overwhelms the system and it has cops working for nothing. And also the court system working pretty much not solving problems. What would be your idea? Because you've written about this extensively for an exec, a successful bail reform. What would it look like in your perspective? Well, I think we always want to look, we, we are a country and a, a society of second chances. We always want to give someone a second chance. And our criminal justice system was originally based upon we, as the number of crimes you commit, the amount of pressure we put on you continues to increase mm -hmm. until you change your actions. And so I, I still, uh, I mean, that is uh, a system of accountability. And mm -hmm. so when we apply accountability and we give the judges the discretion to use that, use their uh, discretion for people who need it, but then uh, allow them to hold people accountable. I mean, really what we've got right now is a complete lack of accountability. We don't have anyone, uh, uh, and we have this all in the name of social justice. We have, we're over, we have more people in jail than any other country. We have a bigger crime. All the drugs come to our country. And so we, of course we have more people in jail because that's where all the drugs come to. And everybody's saying, well, we've lost the war on drugs. So we just need to give up. If we give up on the war of drugs, so many of our other crimes arise mm -hmm from the the drug trade either processing it or selling it or trying to get money to buy it if we give up on the war on drugs we've lost we've lost on crime and that's where we are in our urban areas we've you know the the, the system's overwhelmed like mm -hmm. in Harris County the misdemeanor system is 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 completely uh, broken mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. and the uh, felony system is close behind uh, and you know I've, I'm looking at uh, the misdemeanor system to try to figure out what they're not telling us. And if you look back 10 years ago on the mm -hmm. misdemeanor system uh, about, you know, we had about 43,000 convictions in a year. In 2021, mm -hmm. we had 10,000. And wow. the reason why they're keeping their system from collapsing is they're just dismissing everything. You know, it seems to me that uh, responsibility and accountability has become a dirty word. It's like, no, 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 no accountability down the, down the line from politicians to citizens. It's very uh, bizarre. But on the other hand, you said uh, also we can't give up on the war on drugs. To me, since most drugs seem to be coming across the borders, it would seem like if we increase border uh, protection or, or uh, you know, keeping the borders more secure, that that would pretty much help in the fight against drugs. Am, am, I, I agree. And, mm -hmm. you know, you could make an argument that what would our administration be doing differently currently if they were mm -hmm. in the pocket of organized crime? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I mean, I think you could make a strong argument that they wouldn't be doing anything differently. There was an article in the last week saying that there's enough fentanyl brought into the country illegally to kill every person in the United States. Matters. And now, I, nobody go. seems to be fighting it. Mm. Remember the movie Serpico 70s? A great movie, great story, a uh, true story. Um, but I wonder how much of that has been cleared up or how much of that goes on in law enforcement and government and, and local government, whatever. Um, because basically in that movie, the cops were crooked and they were taking money for drugs and underhanded things. And they said, hey, we don't get paid a lot. Our, our job is dangerous. So this we, we get these cuts from these drug dealers. So, you know, it, it allows us to send our kids to college. And it's a win win. Not. <laughs> well, I, well, I do think that there is a coalition that is supporting, you know, the, the other side. And in that coalition, there's people who want to create chaos. And then there's people who are true believers that we have people who are victims of being, you know, in the urban cities and that they're poor and they shouldn't be punished for being poor. And I, I, I don't, 
I mean, I have some sympathies for that argument, but only on the first or second or third offense, one, because we have more than enough money to provide services. We just have so much corruption that it's not getting anywhere where it needs to be. And then we just don't have truth. We don't have uh, disclosure. I mean, look at what happened in California with Proposition 49. The original argument was, well, we're just going to change some crimes from felonies to misdemeanors, and it's going to actually help because it's more true and we don't really need to have felonies. Well, what happened in reality is they changed them to misdemeanors and then the DAs in the urban cities said, well, we're not going to any, we're not going to prosecute those crimes any longer. And mm -hmm. so as long as you rob something or a Walmart or a Walgreens mm -hmm. of $950 or less, you're not going to get charged. And now you have stores across California closing because they can't afford $25,000, $30,000 or more in shoplifting mm -hmm. every day. And yeah. who's getting punished for that? The you people know? in the neighborhoods. Yeah, the poor neighborhoods. Yes, and the poor neighborhoods. And they mm -hmm. lose the tax base. And so the, the so the so when the politicians won't even protect their mm -hmm. tax base, who does that hurt? It hurts the poor people even more. Now, what would it look like as far as, you know, say someone has offenses, they keep going back to jail for, say, selling pot or whatever. How do we get them to change their behavior? Is it just putting them in jail and holding them accountable with that that punishment, or do we do more than that to keep them from going back to the life in crime? What do we do to get that cycle to stop? Well, you know, what we have right now in the, uh, I think at the end of this defund the police movement is, oh, we just need to replace police officers with, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, caseworkers. And we need mm -hmm. to send out, you know, people who are, uh, you know, like CPS to handle problems mm -hmm. between families. And I think they've already found that, uh, they end up getting shot in their urban cities because who's triaging? Okay, you get a call to 911. Who's deciding whether to send a caseworker or a social mm -hmm. worker or a police officer? They can't. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have that kind of competence, and you're going to end up sending both. And then the case of the social worker is going to be in the way because where are where the guns violence most mm -hmm. uh, when you get a call? It's on family issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like if you look in Texas, Massive. where's the courthouse shootings come from? They arise mm -hmm. from family disputes. And so we can't, I mean, I like to say, look, if you're not going to protect me, at least give me the authority or the ability to protect myself if you're not going to do it. But we seem to be in a period where we don't want you to protect yourself and mm. we're not going to do it. And we just, and we're going to send out little uh, things saying, oh, if you're robbed, just give it to them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nuts to me. I've been seeing that across the cities, but what boggles my mind, see in Houston and Texas, as we both know, we live in Texas, you can carry. And a lot of citizens are, but I find that's not really stopping the crime in Houston. They're still being brazen and going in there uh, to a convenience store and deciding to rob them when very likely the person behind the counter has a gun or a way to protect themselves. I'm like, have you lost your mind? Are you trying to get shot today? Well, and even worse in Texas, since you have the castle doctrine, can you imagine in Harris County if somebody broke into your house? I mean, they would be doing doing a crime where they probably would not even be prosecuted. But if the homeowner has a gun and shoots and kills them, well, then he's not going to be prosecuted under the Castle Doctrine because he has the right to defend his house, mm -hmm. unlike other states where you would not yeah. be able to. And yeah. so you that's we're at the this ultimate irony where. If they were just to commit a crime, uh, breaking in your house and stealing stuff, they wouldn't be prosecuted. But you have the right to defend your house and stop them and kill them to keep mm -hmm. them from doing it. That is just, I mean, that can't be proper and it won't last mm -hmm. for long. I mean, not in Texas. Yeah, it won't. So what can citizens listening in, depending on wherever you are in the country, it could be in, in one of the cities or in the suburbs. What can they do to protect themselves or work for better reform? What can they do on their own part? Well, I still think that the, the, the biggest unanswered question is our urban areas. How do we process mm -hmm. large numbers of people through the jail quickly and efficiently? And, you know, there's only been a set number of ways tried historically. You know, we've got to meet the constitutional requirements. And if we do uh, individual magistration, we know that's proper. We know it meets the requirements. But the problem is Harris County, they've never done that. I mean, they have, on average, they're arresting 1,000 people a week um, just for misdemeanor offenses. And mm -hmm. so they have a jail that holds about 8,000 people. So you, you can do the math. They don't have room and they just can't hold everybody. Mm -hmm. And so historically they've used a bail schedule. Um, the, the, the federal courts have ruled that it meets the constitutional requirements. There mm -hmm. was the suit in the O'Donnell case where they uh, uh, held that they did, they had kind of gotten away from having proper procedures. So mm -hmm. they told them they needed to change their procedures. Then it was fine. But then the county decided to enter into a settlement and just completely get rid of it and mm -hmm. no longer do it. And now they just do what they were doing in New York, which is simple release. 
and you never see a judge get a hundred dollar PR bond. And uh, no matter how many times you commit the crime, you get the same hundred dollar PR bond. It's just simple release, complete failure. It's a failure in New York. They're repealing a lot of it now. They've already re done one round of repeal. Harris County just won't agree. In fact, they're just hiding what they're really doing. Wow. Uh, part of my review is I'm looking at dockets right now, mm -hmm. and I'm finding we've spent a hundred million dollars that only three to 10% of people show up for court. Mm. Yeah, it's to me in your court. And is anybody even saying that? No, no, they're, they're hiding how they've destroyed the misdemeanor uh, 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 bail system in Harris County. And they've completely destroyed it. We have, we're, we're just missing 72% of the cases last year and the year before to keep the case from total collapse. You know, it's, it's insane to me because getting a traffic violation or parking in the wrong place and having my car towed, $450 charge to go get my car out of, you know, being towed or, or paying a, a traffic violation when, you know, not done on purpose. Meanwhile, someone who's actually going out there to commit crimes getting charged less penalty. Mm -hmm. It's kind of insane. Um, so would you suggest that citizens really hit on their elected representatives uh, locally and, and, um, Governor, why? What, what is your suggestion as far as getting the change happening here? Well, I'm going to make a bold statement, and, and mm -hmm. this has become such a political issue mm -hmm. uh, where if you're going to be in one party and you're going to take try to raise money, you have to take certain positions. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have watchdogs watching you like, you know, the Soros funds and all that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't think this is an issue where you can compromise right now because compromise means they're going to tie the hands of the judges and you won't even realize it. And I can give you a really good example in the New Jersey, uh, in the state of New Jersey, when they did bail reform, what, what they said they were trying to do and what they did were two different things. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really have to go in and you have to, you don't take anyone at their word, but I think we have to vote out a lot of politicians and, and terribly it's they're on one party. They're mostly in, in Harris County. They're the democratic party. And yeah. they were all elected with a promise that they were going to vote for the changes in the O'Donnell case. They were going to settle and they were going to give everything that the plaintiffs wanted to them. And as a result, we have, they're hiding what they've done. Mm -hmm. They're hiding that they only have three to seven to 10% of dockets showing up for court. Yeah. And they've spent a hundred million dollars to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and they won't admit what they've done. And and we've got an election coming up. And so what they're doing is they're blaming the bell industry and saying mm -hmm. uh, their fault. So we, we're going to regulate what they charge when you, you could see it on a graph as the use of surety bonds have gone down. The crime has substantially increased, but mm -hmm. it's still their fault. It was their fault, you know, five, six years ago when they did all this, it's still their fault now. Mm -hmm. And it's just a blame game. Uh, they're yeah. playing on people's emotions. They don't care whether the system works mm -hmm. and, um, and, and they're hiding that it's not. Yeah, I like that you say uh, they play on your emotions because often all the political stuff going on right now in the news, which I, I, I haven't watched actually news news in over 20 years um, because of the emotional ploys and spin they do to get you to see their narrative is the right narrative. Um, I told people back in 2016 when they either didn't like Trump or liked him or whatever, there was a lot of strong emotion. I'm like, listen, this is not a football baseball game here. You're not supposed to be voting based on your emotions. And I like this team or I like that team Base it on actual um, actions that you can see, do these match your values? Is what's happening out in the world in your local community, is this what you want to see for your kids, for your life? If not, pick people who match that, whose actions match what you want to see in your community, not that blue team, red team, whatever team. It, that drives me nuts. Well, it's really hard now because we're kind of at a, at a period of time where we're electing representatives mm -hmm. from the extremes of both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, really, people realize that, you know, with the end of the filibuster at the uh, at the Senate, we've we're now uh, nominating uh, candidates for the U.S. Supreme Court from the extremes of both parties. We're doing strong conservatives or strong liberals. We're not doing any moderates where that was, you know, where you had to at least aim for or give mouth uh, lip service that that's what you're doing to be able to get somebody nominated and yeah. get them affirmed. But now it's just from the extremes. And, and you can really see it from one side. It just is like uh, a mm -hmm. mudslinging for the whole time uh, during that. Uh, and I don't know what we can do about that uh, because we've had this identity politics around for a while. And, uh, you know, if you're 
arguing issues with uh, other, the other side or mm-hmm. the extremes of either party, you're going to find that one side is doesn't respond. They don't respond to mm-hmm. arguments anymore. They just say, mm-hmm. you're racist, you're an idiot, you're sexist, mm-hmm. and, and which is just code to their followers. You don't, don't listen to them. You don't have to, uh, you can shut down now and mm-hmm. they don't ever have to respond. And that's where the real weakness is coming because when that ends, they're not going to be able to respond to the arguments. Yeah, because what we have is echo chambers on both sides and and both sides going and shutting down. And when it comes to law and you're picking a judge, there should be no right, left, whatever. You're there to uphold the law, whether you like it. You're not there to be an activist judge and say, well, this is my feelings. I like this or I like that. It's not about that. It's about following the letter of the law and the Constitution, period. Well, we just nominated someone from the Supreme Court and confirmed them. And they were a perfect example where... They were apologizing. You can say what you want. She was apologizing to criminals Mm -hmm. for the sentence that she gave them. And she was deviating to the minimum sentence or even below the minimum sentence. And she still felt the need to apologize to them for what she was doing. And so it's like we've lost who is the victim. And and I really do think that we're seeing uh, our criminal justice system uh, influenced by, uh, you know, the Soros of, of the world who are pushing yeah. candidates and giving them lots of money with, uh, with the, the agreement that they'll support certain things. And we now have, you know, uh, one of those backed uh, DAs who's under a recall mm-hmm. vote. And yeah. the most recent polling was like 60 to 70% of even Democrats were going to vote to, to, uh, to, um, mm-hmm. br- uh, br- to repeal them or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, we may have an election this time where for the first time in a long time, identity was overcome with an issue and the issue is Mm -hmm. safety. Everybody wants to feel safe. And if they don't feel safe, then they're not going to care about your identity. They're going to vote for the person they feel will make them safe. Yeah. And, and, you know, really at the end of the day, that is the job of government to keep their citizens safe. um, From that's right. I mean, why are we forgetting that? And you know what, but when you have the DA of LA, and his staff come out and say, well, I think we just have a disagreement over who the real victim is. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a minute. If you have a sitting DA saying that, then who is in the courtroom arguing for the victim of that crime? Nobody. Mm-hmm. There is nobody there giving a voice to the victim. And that's his job is to give the voice to the victim uh, and, and to do what's right and give the benefit of the doubt to the defendant. But when he's up there saying, well, we just have a disagreement over who the, over who the real victim is. Yeah. That. Yeah. It's awful. It is. It is awful. Uh, my my one suggestion, as I said, um, four or five years ago, really uh, vote not with your emotions, but with, you know, really reason and thought and, and look at the person's actions. And again, do they match the values you want to see in your community? If not, just don't vote for them based on they're in the party. I've always you know, picked or whatever. Um, Because we really, the only way we can make a difference is starting first locally, but each of us saying we're going to pay attention to what's going on locally and not look at things emotionally. Well, we, you know, where we see this is, you know, where this is taking hold is in our Democratic strongholds. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we have the extremes picking off within themselves and who are they hurting the most? Because the inner cities are full of, you know, this is minority on minority crime. So mm-hmm. who's suffering the most from this? It's yeah. other minorities. And, and so, I mean, it is just, I mean, it's unbelievable that this is happening. It doesn't mm-hmm. make sense to me because of my values. But, I mean, I want to say that they're just creating chaos. But I don't think everybody in that coalition, coalition believes that. But mm-hmm. I do think some in that co- coalition believe that. Yeah. Well, this has been a really deep conversation. One, I hope that our audience will look more deeply on at themselves and start to look at the evidence, whoever they think they like or don't like, go deeper into it before we hit the next elections and see who do who best serves our local community, our state, and, and then ultimately our federal government. But I just have to thank you again, Ken W. Good, for coming to share your great wisdom today on Savvy Broadcasting Forbidden Speech. Thank you. Thank you. Now, where can they find out more about you just before we leave? Where's the best place? The best place is uh, PBX, uh, pbtx.com, which is our website. We have a, a lot of resources on there. We have a blog. We have a download center. And we also have our own little podcast, which is called The Bell Post, where we try to uh, focus on um, 
uh, criminal justice issues to educate people on what the real issues are, why crime is increasing, and um, uh, and those would be a great place to build build upon. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for coming, Ken, to Savvy Broadcasting. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You betcha. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more Forbidden Speech or Savvy episodes, visit SavvyBroadcasting.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at LifeUnscriptedRadio.com.